Welcome to the first video of my series that I'm going to do on reloading the 45 automatic. The main reason I'm actually starting to do reloading videos is because a lot of my favorite reloading channels are just don't upload much anymore uh, to the consistency that they used to. And I remember when I was started reloading about 10 years ago, I learned so much from watching these people and their, their vast wealth of knowledge. And I was hoping that I could provide some level that might even come close to comparing what they were able to provide back in the day. And I hope that you can get something out of this. Now, I don't know if I'm actually gonna go through how to reload or the whole reloading process as much as I am the load development. I might, we'll see. But to start off, I'm just gonna go through, you know, in each episode, the, the final load development and then the shots and the results. And then if it gets good enough views, then I might actually take the time to film the actual ammo manufacturing process. So the gun we're gonna be using is my Smith & Wesson E-Series 1911. It's a five inch government model, obviously chambered in 45 ACP. And I picked it up probably three weeks ago. I have about 250 rounds of factory ammo on it and it shoots fantastic. So what I'm looking for in a hand load is something that is 100% reliable enough to cycle the weapon and function, but something that doesn't quite recoil as much as factory target ammo to, I guess, give longer service loss to the weapon if I want to go shoot a competition with it, have a little less recoil, and just be a little more enjoyable to plink with at the range. Now, I don't have any problem with factory 230 grain ball ammo. But it's always nice when you can download things a little bit. So the parts and pieces that we're going to be using, we got some Extreme Bullets 200 grain plated. And the purpose of starting off with these is not only looking for a pleasant shooting load, but a very affordable load that compares to factory ammo. So this is what I'm starting off with. I might try some other stuff, and I'm definitely going to get a mold and cast some bullets for it up and into that lately. So we'll see kind of where the rabbit hole takes us. We're gonna be using Federal 150 grain, or 100, number 150 large pistol primers. And I got three powders just picked out off the shelf that I'm gonna start off with, being Tight Group, HP 38, and CFE Pistol. I've also got some unique that we're gonna to toy with uh, for, for funsies. But I know it's, it's not a very common 45 ACP powder. So the source for the load data, we're going to be primarily using the Lee reloading manual. Uh, forget what it did. The second edition Lee reloading manual. And the reason that is, is because it actually has information for copper plated bullets, which a lot of reloading manuals do not. So we're going to extrapolate that data, compare it to jacketed data and cast bullet data. And I think it's gonna give us the best knowledge base to start off with our load development. The dies that we're gonna be using are the Lee four die set, which consists of a resizing and decapping die, a powder through expanding die, a bullet seating and crimping die, which we're not going to be crimping with it. I've backed it off to where it just seats the bullet. And then a Lee factory crimp die, which we're going to be used to apply our taper print to the bullet. It's the best value that you can get in reloading. I like a bunch of dies, but for pistols, I tend to stick with Lee unless I'm loading cast bullets, in which I use the RCBS Cowboy die set. So we're gonna start off with tight group in episode two, just because I use it for my nine mil and I think it's a very affordable powder, pretty accurate powder. But one thing I'd like to address when I was starting to make my dummy rounds for this to set my dies up is the cartridge overall length and bullet setback. So for those of you that don't know, bullet setback happens when there's not enough crimp applied to the bullet or not enough neck tension, uh, depending on what kind of uh, case you're using. And when you chamber the round or under recoil, it actually 
sets, the bullet uh, decreases in overall length and sets back in the case. Now this can be from recoil while the bullet or the cartridge is sitting in the magazine, or as it is getting loaded from the magazine onto the feed ramp and hits that feed ramp and goes up, the bullet actually gets pushed back into the case. Now with 1911s, it's a known thing for the feed ramp to be at a very aggressive angle and it can cause bullet setback. Now 45 ACP is not a very high pressure cartridge, but it's still not something you wanna see. So when I was making my dummy rounds and cycling them through a number of different magazines, these don't have any primers in them, obviously, but this is the whole pile of dummy rounds I've gone through playing with crimp amount. As you can see, uh, where is a good short one? Right here. This guy has set back in the case a large amount compared to this one because of the lack of crimp. So I've actually had to apply a pretty hefty crimp. And uh, upon doing some research, apparently set back in 1911s are a, is a common thing, but it's not something you want to see. So I've ended up crimping to a neck diameter of about 0.466. Now, for example, the crimp on a piece of factory, this is just Winchester 230 grain ball, is about 4.69. So I'm having to crimp it about three thousandths more. Now, when seating a piece of factory ball, it does set back about five thousandths of an inch. So this is a uh, 1.25, and when I've measured them, they all decrease between three and seven thousand, so about five thousandths on average. So what I've tried to do is match the setback to what the factory ammo has given me, which I assume is a safe, allowable amount. Now, preferably, I'd like to see none, but my crimping die is about maxed out on what I can crimp without actually cracking the case necks. So. Go ahead and show you what I mean. So my OAL that I'm gonna be starting with is 1.26, and that is from Extreme's website. They give me the OAL for their projectiles. So I'll go ahead and load it up in a Wilson mag. And once again, this has no primer in it. It's a dummy round. Go ahead and do it from slot drop. Take it out, eject, and now let's measure it. So you can see, I don't know if you'll be able to actually see it if the camera will focus. I just use my phone because I can't afford a real fancy camera. But right there is where it hits that feed ramp and gets pushed up in there. Put a little indention on it. So get this focus back right. Let's see. 1.255, so about five thousandths of bullet setback, which I find is acceptable. Before I got the crimp to where it was, it was setting back quite a decent amount, anywhere between 10 and 15 thousandths, depending on the magazine and how much ammo I had in the magazine. A lot of people don't realize that um, when you have a full mag in a 1911, that first round tends to want to nosedive, which causes it to hit that feed ramp at a steeper angle and shoot back up into it. So the first round of a fully loaded magazine in a 1911 is always going to be the harshest. But anyways, that's what we're working with. Pretty stiff crimp, uh, 1.260 starting OAL. Three powders from extreme 200 grain bullets and federal primers and a beautiful Smith & Wesson 1911. So stick around for the follow-on videos, and we're going to go through load development for each one of these powders, and then possibly some different projectiles here in the future. Thanks for watching.